Hey, Print Hustlers, Bruce from Printavo, Simple Shop Management Software. Really excited to be able to have a couple guests today on this week's podcast. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research, and after Print Hustlers Conf, I wanted to chat more about this, so we'll just hop on in. We've got Matt Marcotte at Printavo. Thanks for being able to take some time to join us. Of course, yeah. And then we've got Lon Winters from Graphic Elephants out of Colorado. Thanks again for uh, taking some time out. I reached out to both of you guys, Matt, actually super excited to be joining the Printavo team, but mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah. Lon hasn't just yet, but we're working on that. <laughs> but um, but we, we had a really good conversation at Print House West Conf. I feel like we went into a little bit of a tangent, but around computer to screen, direct to screen, whatever you like to call it, and the benefits of it. And so I wanted to just be able to talk about it. And I know, Matt, you've worked with it heavily at shops that do have it, that don't have it, you, you know, selling it, all that, and especially you, Lon. As I've talked to so many shops, and I always love to ask, what is a piece of equipment that you wish you would have bought earlier? I would say 90% of shops say computer to screen. For sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, which, which is crazy. Like, it's not the second auto. It's not the third auto. It's not, uh, you know, like anything else. It's usually always that. So just diving in, I mean, Lon, what, what do you feel like from a high level are some of the large benefits of making that leap? You know, I'm sure through your articles and conversations at uh, Print Hustlers as, as well as other places, the, the big stuff is easy. Um, you're replacing film with direct to screen. It, it's uh, the general ROI that you can put together with, with some of the manufacturers is pretty straightforward, but what we found, and, and I'd go into that same group that you're talking about, what piece of equipment do you wish you'd owned earlier? I would for sure be in that same group. We, we bought ours, <clears throat> I'm going to say five or six years ago, iImage with the, the scanner, onboard scanner. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the minute we installed it, they had the onboard starlight on the back. So <laughs> um, we had to upgrade right away. But, but ultimately, you're... Um, we bought it out because I thought I wanted it rather than needed it. We grew up doing uh, film, four color process, sim process, paying a thousand dollars for a set of film from Coudre and Cerachrome and you know the best separators in the world, and a thousand bucks a job for for film, and then wrestling the film on screen with stencil systems twenty years ago, thirty years ago versus what's available today. We got pretty good at it but I'm an old school film guy and the hard round dot I can get on film versus inkjet. We transitioned through the inkjet phase and the, for the thermal inkjet then the inkjet. And we know we had some compromise in our dots. They go from hard edge dots to little amoebas. And we transitioned through that and learned how to deal with it. But, you know, then they were argument on the, on the inkjet to screen, whether it's wax or, or ink, uh, water, water-based uh, ink, it, the splatter and the, you know, all those, there was just some, I wouldn't call it negativity, but it wasn't, the people that were buying in 20, 25 years ago were bigger. And then you'd hear horror stories. Yeah, we installed one, we sent it back. We installed three, we had to send two back. Um, they were in here every other week. We were blowing heads up, they're $10,000 ahead. So we really hesitated and finally, uh, being a kind of a lifelong uh, loyal dog, we we were talked into purchasing the eye image, and I wanted one because I wanted to do more accurate screen making. And the easy things that we talked about that 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 change uh, were all on the the ROI sheet. But what we found was it was way more about the intangibles and the additional. Um, ability to do other things and be that much more productive with the setup um, in that you're, you know, all the things like dust on the glass and, and scratches on the film and the dumbest ones where you lost one of the pieces of film and you made all the screens <laughs> except for the one film. And so you re output the film and it doesn't fit to all the other screens and all those stupid shit little things that add up to setting up a job in an hour for an hour and then going, oh shoot, we got to take it down because we got to start all over. You know, it's the little things, burning a piece of film under a flash, um, just 
not realizing that that's something's missing or something got wet or um, all of those things. And then the fact that your registration system goes from being okay and if I do it myself, I can make the film work. But as soon as you add additional people doing each piece of a registration system, it's 80% accurate. And when it's off, it's way off and you've got to remake a screen. Um, I'd venture to say we're in the top upper 90 percentile on accuracy with a pre-registration system because it all it all makes it all the way through the setup so where we maybe were averaging seven eight nine ten minutes a screen and when you're doing a 13 color sim process job that's an hour and a half hour and 40 minutes setup and you take that down to two or three minutes a screen realistically just because it's that accurate and that's a hard sell. It's hard. Matt knows more about this than I do. It's hard to tell people, oh, your 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 registration time is going to go from ten minutes to screen. You're going to cut that in half or in, in in a quarter. And people don't buy it. People don't believe it until you do it. And then you're like, oh, we could never go back. Knock on wood. We only have one. I hate not having redundancy, other than going back to film if we if we have to. But the idea that it changed our world of accuracy as well as productivity. And what we do with benchmarking and, and R&D, it's that much more critical that we get from one project to the next project and we can't be fiddling around with stupid things like lost pieces of film. You've it's been nodding you a lot over there. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of like remembering horror stories of things, right? Like, <laughs> uh, so one of, the, one of the first shops that I ran, we had in Lon, I'm sure you remember this, the eye screen. Right, the oh, yeah. up and down one, it was nicknamed the eye scream because all you could ever do with it, right? You just want to sit there and shake it, like try to Fonzie <laughs> it to make it work. It never worked right. And then we went to like the ski jump model, right? Where it was like kind of like up and, up and exactly. And that one finally, I still run the shop, it finally started to work. I still, I was one of those ones that was like, mm, okay, I've, I've got guys on the production floor been printing for longer than I've been alive, right? I've been printing for a number of years. You can't tell me this is gonna be faster than the experience, right? When it comes to setup that immediately was blown out of the water. I had like a bear toe come in and he comes in with a tri-lock jig and I'm like, oh, let's see what this guy's gotten. Exactly that, like we were doing a lot of like sim process or actually traditional process work that oftentimes was like seven or eight colors. So it was kind of process, right? And he goes over there and just knocks him right in. I was like, what? So magic. I, 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 exactly, I was that. And then I got the transition into doing the sales and consulting side and taking a lot of the, the guys that maybe had been doing it, right? They had been making films, they had the Bellow camera systems 30 years ago. And it sometimes it's hard to be like, okay, the amount of, uh, of mad science that went to making into a good film, you can't tell me that you can do that better now with a rip software and a machine spitting out ink. It's not gonna be there. And that was the majority of the fun that I had with those gigs, right? Is okay, game on, let's find out. And exactly that, taking somebody who, maybe was like the, the, the king of the cast of the shop that was the only one that could go reg these jobs. And then you throw a 13 color job at a newbie in the corner and give them a good registration system on their press with a, a screen off of a computer screen. It just, it's there, it, it hits. There's some little variables you gotta control, but if it takes you five minutes of screen, that's still faster than you're gonna usually get trying to do those, those really fine dot detail prints. It's fun hearing your, your growth from that because you've been around doing it longer than I have, right? And I can totally relate and you can see that difference of, okay, what are the, what are the things that are not on the ROI sheet that are given by the manufacturer? And yeah. what does that say? Film saving and finding film there. That was like one of the biggest pain points that was never really accounted for, right? You lose a film and it, it's a pain. Not only do you have to try to find that film, but when you find it, is it got a crease in the middle? Is it have water spots? What's wrong? Did somebody sneeze on it and now it's ruined. Oh, that's the worst, right? And that happens all the time. Or, okay, the artist quit and it's on their computer. We don't even have the art file. None of these screens are gonna be good. Let's go back to square one. All those things, those intangibles like you talked about that are huge time savings, that it, it's, it's a no brainer for me. Envelopes lined up for film. And then if you've misfiled something, <sighs> I mean, you've got thousands of envelopes. If it didn't get filed in the right place, you, it's gone. I had to hire a high schooler every summer to go through, I'd print out what we printed that year in that year's time since the last summer. And if we hadn't printed it, they had to go through thousands of these files that were like wedged together on these racks, pull them out and like pull out these films. And I'm just watching them recycle or throw away like just dollars and dollars and dollars, right? So we were even using an image setter. We weren't even just making film. We had an actual image setter 
So it was even more expensive. It's not like you see like a, oh, a dollar a film for an 11 by 17, right? It was multiple dollars that had to go through a, a, a full solution to create that, that image on that film, that transparency. So it, it was a giant, I'm just watching dollars drip out everywhere. It's like, oh, this is brutal. Um, so yeah, it's going CTS. I found that a lot of shops, obviously the auto is the first thing they wish they would have bought earlier. And then like Bruce said, it's never a second auto. It's never an embroidery machine. It's, it's not even like their, their awesome production manager. It's, we should have gone sooner with that CTS, right? Just being able to do that and output that and find that time savings and then train people to be amazing printers that much faster. It game changer, right? What do you think is the biggest holdback of people going? Cause you guys are both either consulted with shops or sold you know, equipment to shops. What do you think is the biggest stopping point for shops for making that commitment? Is it the cost? It's an investment. I think there's still a, a lack of real understanding of what productivity really means. Mm -hmm. um, yep. We're still sort of stuck in how fast the press goes round and round. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up with that. You know, you were a weenie if you had to double stroke. You're even bigger weenie if you have to run it around twice. You know, so it was, it was all about you know, 900 pieces an hour, 1,000 pieces an hour. Well, that doesn't matter when your runs are 60 pieces uh, on average. You know, if you got 20,000 pieces, sure, that matters. But I don't remember the last time we ran 20,000 pieces. It's been a long, long time. So it's a, a complete and total mind shift of managing to the job and managing to get X number of jobs out based on your averages versus how fast the press goes around and around. So that's important and it's still a piece of it but the magic becomes how quickly you can get a press up and get a press down so when i work with shops that are looking at their second automatic or they're looking at you know i need to increase my productivity by 30 percent it's so i guess easy or seems to be easy to them well i got three machines i need to increase my productivity by 30 percent i just add a machine it's like well okay that's the easy way to look at it but I'll bet if we streamline your free press, i.e. with uh, CTS, that you probably can get twice as much out of your three machines versus adding a fourth machine based on take your setups from 10 minutes to five minutes or seven minutes to three minutes, whatever it is. But if you can cut your setup time by chasing around the imagery that's plus or minus an eighth inch, on, a, on bigger jobs in particular, that means, you know, if your, your average runs, again, I always do the easy math. If your average runs are 100 pieces and you expect 10 100 piece runs a day, you only got to find a few minutes per job to add another, a jo another job to the day. So then you get 11 jobs out today. And then that it easily becomes 12 jobs. And if you start managing to the, to the jobs instead of managing to the number of pieces, because that's how, I mean, we all kind of, grew up that way on your production board. You fill in the numbers. I got 3,000. I got 3,500. Well, that's great if you have one setup and some one color. Um, it's not so great when you've got 10, six colors you've got to get done for the day. It changes the, the whole dynamics of the industry. What we do and how we manage it is totally different today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's just, it's a different business. And I think business owners look at it from back a few years ago instead of looking at it today i might have mentioned it during the, the conference that we won't even set up a new automatic shop without putting at least cts in if not automatic developing and automatic coding and there's no reason to learn the film game if you don't have to so why put the mm. x number of years in dealing with film let's just start out where you take the screen off the machine, you develop it and put it in, in press. I mean, it's a whole lot easier learning curve with people that get into the business too. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed a lot too is a lot of times the shops are just so busy, right? They're so busy kind of chasing the tail, chasing the work, chasing those jobs out the door that they have never really done that ROI, right? They might've had the, the rep come in to try to sell them something, but Obviously, they're a salesperson. I mean, I've been a salesperson and consultant too, so they're kind of they're chasing their own goal, right? But when they actually break down that ROI to include all those intangibles you're talking about, it is one of the easiest sales to make. And looking at like adding a press, right? There's a lot more that goes into that press. You got to run the electric for it, right? You have to get flashes for it, right? You have to make sure you have a dry dryer space open for it. So so many peripherals that get added on to the idea of adding a press. So you can look at okay, well, what else can I do? 
And exactly that, fixing what has to always happen with that screen. A screen always has to be reclaimed. A screen always has to be coded. A screen always has to be imaged. Getting those things to be repetitive, and more sustainable and more repeatable is huge. So for me, I honestly found the most success with, I don't want to say easily selling direct to screen, but honestly it kind of sold itself once you actually got them to look at those figures and analyze those numbers. It wasn't that they weren't doing their job. They were just so busy doing other parts of their job and no, no one was really breaking it down for them that simply to showcase that exactly like you said, I can add one to two more jobs a day on your current presses. So for a fraction of the cost you'd look at to get another auto, we're going to be able to add X amount per week, per month. What is that actual gain to per year? And you're now looking at a different profit margin, right? So the ROI and it compounds so much easier. And so I've always found exactly like you said, that going with a coder, going with reclaim machine, if you can even the, the, uh, the post rinse machine. And then of course, a CTS, it pays for itself in dividend and it makes everything so much easier. And like you said too, if you're, why get to becoming a pro at the film game anymore? When it's all automated, right? Skip those steps. It feels weird because like I actually did like cut Ruby lift, right? I remember like pulling out half tone grids. It doesn't exist anymore. Most people talk to me like, what? What is, what is Ruby lift? And like, that's crazy. I wasn't even in as long as you've been in it. So like it goes even farther, but it's all become so automated and so repeatable. After that first auto, get it, get the CPF. Yeah. Everything you do in our business and probably in life, you get something, but you got to give up something. We're getting more consistency, more speed, automation, repeatability, a little bit easier, a lot of bit easier training. We still, going back to the inkjet, we still don't get a, an absolute hard dot, but you get on contact imagery instead of film imagery. There's so many things that you gain that I, I kind of got over the hard dot thing. And the kind of work that you can do that most of us are doing, many of us are doing with BTS, you know, maybe you could still make an argument. Even the guys that own Cerachrome, who are old school film guys who held out on the digital direct forever are running or run CTS. There's just too much upside. You give a little, but you're gaining so much more that it, it becomes that no brainer. What I was, what's funny about what, what Matt's saying how many sales guys from dealers when a, a company owner says, Hey Matt, I need you to quote me a new 14 color. Oh, and I'll need a dryer and three flashes are going to go, you know what? You don't need that. What you need is to spend $30,000, not 160. So that's, that's part of it too, is because mm -hmm. we, as shop owners want to increase their productivity and they, and I don't even think it's on purpose, but, who on the manufacturing or dealer side is going to go, oh, I can't do that. What we want to do is automate a couple things over here and spend a little less money and not take up all that space. We can, we can increase uh, productivity over there at another time. So there's kind of that balance too. So sales guys and manufacturers didn't necessarily know how to sell it either because they're kind of selling against some of their other, other equipment. I don't think any of us really value our time as much, right? And maybe that's because you start by not valuing your time. And like, that's what you're so trained to do is like something happens, just do it. This, this comes up, just do it. Right. Sure. But, but there is that business transition of, okay, we got to stage one, whether it's a half million dollars, whether it's a million, whatever you felt like the, starting to hire people and starting to grow and then getting to that next stage, it's not the same things that we got to that first one where, it's like just time forcing everything, just spending 12 hours a day doing it. It doesn't scale to the next step. I always just find it interesting just because of that mental shift is so hard to make. Whereas this aligns exactly in the same way where it's like hard to value all that time spent that went into the pre-production aspects, to the artwork aspects, the registration, like all those things together. It's just like, oh, well, the cost of this piece of equipment is X or the cost of this new press is Y and we need, just need to print more, force more through. I think part of it too, is you're seeing that people feel like they're being overrun by robots, right? So I've worked with some of the most talented pre-press guys that can come very close to within like parts of an inch to actually line up film on multiple screens day in and day out, right? So you take, you take that guy who's doing that job really well for 15, 20 years, you start telling them like, 
hey, I can bring anybody off the street in and have them make a perfect screen just by getting some automation, they're going to hate you, right? <laughs> so that, that, that's part of it too. Like you don't want to feel like you're putting them out of a job, but that's also part of, part of what you're saying too. Like they've spent so much time that sometimes subtly they think that the only way to be successful is to put in the time. Mm -hmm. And that's not really, that's not really the equation for success, right? So getting them to flip that switch and understand that I'm not going to replace you. I might replace like one or two other people that you kind of have turnover and turn in the employee all the time, right? Your reclaimer that might kind of get changed out of a couple of months. We're going to create more sustainability also with your employment, right? We're going to have one person creating almost perfection out of a whole department. It's cleaner. It's easier. It's more sustainable it's more fun. You're not breaking your back all day anymore. You're moving around, hitting buttons on machines and making the machines do your bidding, right? You're doing, it's doing what they want. So that's part of it too, is taking a lot of this mentality out of automation being a negative. It's not a negative. And it's not going to replace the jobs that, that are really vital. It, it may clean up a little bit when it comes to the one or two peripheral bodies that you have that you really don't need, but you need them to do a dirty job. They don't want to do that dirty job either. So avoiding those things are changing that only strengthens that person. But it is hard to change the psyche of the person, like you said, has been doing those 12 hour days, making perfect screens the best way they could for so long to now see this new new era of automation to change things completely. But, but every every industry has to see it, right? So sure. I think we're just definitely seeing it and it continues to evolve now in our, in our industry. That's the first piece probably that starts the automation process. And uh, Matt, you probably had some customers like this. If you get them talked in the finally pulling the trigger on CTS. Uh, next year, it's uh, automatic developing. The following year, um, you usually get them on automatic coding right away uh, with the, the uh, CTS, and then it's automatic reclaim, and it's automatic. I mean, ultimately, you take a four or five person screen department that's maybe running 100, 125 screens a day, and you whittle it down to two that are running 200 screens a day. Mm -hmm. um, and I, those are real numbers. That's not something I'm just making up. That's we've seen it in mm -hmm. multiple operations and they maybe transition the automation they resist and finally go CTS and then quickly they automate a, a lot of the other pieces of it because they realize in our business, the biggest line item on our p &L is labor. labor and there's a ton of unskilled labor as well. Now you can take that guy that's got all the experience and say, hey, this is your new toy, this is your new baby. You don't have to get the loop out and look at film all day, but you're gonna have to keep this thing humming and keep the other guy running and the, the, the automation piece of it, push this button and that button, push this button, push that button, end up orchestrating a screen department or pre-press department rather than having somebody uh, cleaning screens and somebody coating and somebody developing and, I mean, all those things end up taking almost a body a day if you're doing roughly 100, 100 screens a day. And hopefully the, the savings on the ROI on that also has a trickle down effect to that employee, right? If you're cutting three bodies out of the labor cost, you're gonna be able to pay off that equipment faster. You're gonna get better ROI overall and better margins overall. So when it comes to the end of the year, when it's like, okay, hopefully I can get, get a raise, Ideally, there's more money in the pot for that raise. So sure. it's not replacing the, the people, it's strengthening the people that are there, giving them a better career and lighter on their body. So it, it, it can seem scary, but it, once it has time to filter through your shop, not, it's, it's, it's got dividends all, all over, right? The, the financial aspect for the company, uh, the automation for the company, the dropping the extra labor. And like I said, hopefully adding to uh, the income of those people that are now running that and have more pride in it too. I found that people had a lot more pride when they had these nice big machines around them, right? As opposed to when they're in the dark back room covered in spray off, right? And like reeking of chemicals and they're like, here's your screen. And you're just like, oh my God, right? So they, they have a lot more pride in their work. The area is cleaner. And I think we all know that always makes you feel better about the work you're doing. So it just, every time you look into it, there's more and more benefit for it. Sure. Well, and as a business owner, and I, this isn't the case all the time, but much of the time, when you pull the trigger on a thirty to ninety thousand dollar piece of equipment, you tend to want to take better care of it. So all of a sudden, we might climate control the area it's going in. We might paint the walls. We might run a little AC in there. We might put some tile on the floor, and all of a sudden, we've got a, a, a much higher end kind of uh, 
free press department as opposed to the, as everybody will call it, the back room. Um, <laughs> and then you start taking customers in to show them, check this out, this, this is pretty cool. Because uh, your clients don't typically know how any of that's made, but to watch it print directly on the screen is, is pretty cool. They're always more impressed that way too. They're never impressed with the old school way where you're like, you're making the film, you're lining it up. Like, <laughs> that's really more impressive. They're like, Ooh, sweet robot. And you're like, well, uh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> when, when do you guys feel like it's the best time to make that leap? Like a, a good best practice. Is it first autos purchased? It's paid off maybe. I mean, there's a couple aspects here, right? Financial prudence. Uh, I'm sure volume is, is a big one, but, what would you say you recommend? Matt can speak more to the, the specifics of the manufacturers ROIs on number of screens. That's kind of how they approach it. Um, if you do X number of screens, then we can get you an ROI in one year, two years, whatever. And I argue that they're super conservative. I think that their numbers are higher than they need to be. I don't know if you should even be automated without CTS. Why bother? And this is just opinion. I don't have the data to necessarily back it up and support it. But I think you can be in the neighborhood of 25 screens and, and make sense of it. Mm. Um, the lease payment on it is minimal, especially if you're a small automated shop and you're opting for the $35,000 unit, not the $90,000 unit. Um, you can get it paid off pretty darn quick, especially at, at startup. If you're a single automatic shop and you've been a single automatic shop for 10 years, maybe it's your next purchase, but I'm not going to begrudge you for not having it up to now, because I was that guy too. I held out a long time. But it, it seems to me if, you're, if you've got enough volume to automate the printing process, you've got enough volume to automate the screen making process. Maybe not entirely, but at the very least, the CTS piece of it. And I'm maybe oversimplifying that, and that maybe has more specifics on the numbers, but that seems to make the most sense to me. Now, I'm not, it's not my money, so. <laughs> They're writing the check, so it's easy for me to make the, you know, the compelling argument that this is where you really need to go. We have a customer in Utah that, for whatever reason, listened to everything we told them to do and started with CTS, and they had a single automatic. Now they've completely automated their front end. Other than reclaim, they just don't have the space, and they're up to three automatics, and they've grown the company about three times since we first worked with them. So it's, it makes complete sense once you do it with that automation piece of it in mind. And then it just kind of, it grows into the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, one of those rules of automation, right, is it, it costs money to make money. Uh, I, when I was selling these, the equipment stuff, I would look at it and usually say, look, if you're doing 50 screens a day, I can 99% of the time get the ROI for you to be within a year to two years, almost always. But I agree, if, if you're doing 20 to 25 screens a day, it's still worth it, especially if you go into the entry level CTS, right? And, and they're still amazing machines. It's just going to have one print head as opposed to two or three. It's not going to have the, the starlight built in. It's still a great machine. So in most cases, I, I couldn't agree more. If you already have an auto, it should be the next purchase you make, right? With a coder. I, I, also, I do like to package those together, get the coder in there. It's more, more reliable, more consistent. Mm -hmm. If you are a manual and you are running all day long printing and you're actually putting up 25, 30 screens a day, get it before you get that auto. Exactly. Build those good habits on the pre-press side. That way, when you do get the auto, the learning curve is that much easier, right? You don't have to sit there and worry about your micro adjustments so much. You'll have to learn those things, of course, but you'll be able to have more consistency and get it in there. So sure. I, I, I couldn't agree more. It, it, 25 is usually a point where it start, it's worth looking into it. Um, at 50, I think it's, it's almost yeah. always been a no brainer. And I'd say one out of a hundred times I couldn't get somebody to, uh, show profit on that within that, that year to year and a half. That, and that's, that seems to be the standard with the manufacturers is somewhere around 50 screens to argue the 25 screens or less than that. You got to buy into the intangible pieces of it, the mm -hmm. immeasurables that you can't necessarily put on paper. And I'm sure that's why the manufacturers are hesitant to, to give numbers to lost film. I mean, you, you can't give that a number. Aggressive, forward-thinking shop owners can look at it if they buy the intangible piece of it and make sense of the other things that can't necessarily be put into numbers. If you want to go pure numbers, the easy ROI is 50 screens a day. Interesting. What, so there's a lot of options, right? There's 
doubt hits, MNRs, exiles, uh, this iJet, Sati. I mean, there's just, there's a fair amount of options out there. I've seen also discussion, especially online around Wax versus Inc. Is it a, a kind of environment decision or, or what do you feel like is the, the best way for people to be able to make that um, leap? As unbiased, obviously, <laughs> as you guys both can, but you know, yeah. to, to help people to evaluate which one's best for them, especially with that wide price range that you talk about. I've seen all the test prints and I can tell you that a wax manufacturer might compare their very best output to an ink manufacturer's very worst output. And mm -hmm. to any Tom, Dick and Harry, you can go, oh my God, I'd never be able to use this. This looks fantastic. They're probably a little closer than that. I think that a wax dot is probably better than an inkjet dot, but I think I can get a pretty damn good wet ink, inkjet dot by slowing down the equipment. Now the manufacturer wouldn't want to hear me say that, but that's what I've done with a lot of our clients is they sell it on speed and we slow it down when we work with them. Um, they print bi-directional, we try to talk them into printing unidirectional. Mm -hmm. um, they print on high speed, we try to print on low speed. We try to increase their passes. Um, so I can take the inkjet's very best print and put it against the wax and it can it can stand with it, but I would still concede that concede that the wax dot is a little better. So if you're a dot Nazi, um, then that may make more sense. Now there's not an entry level price point on a wax machine either. I think minimums 60 or 70, and that's just a dart. I think I know right around there. Yeah, their heads are a little more expensive. They come down, and I like all those guys, and we've done a ton of work with them and uh, some of our clients and even bought some and installed them in startups. It depends on what you're printing. It depends on what you, your needs are um, as to whether one is better than the other based on a better dot, a harder dot. There's there, mm -hmm. neither one of them are a hard dot to a traditional wet image setter piece of film, but the, the wax dot is a little bit probably cleaner. But if you can slow down and dial in your curves and all those kinds of things on, on the, uh, inkjet, um, you can get very good dots. It just, it takes a little bit of work and you can't expect to run. If, you, if you're only doing a hundred screens a day, why are you running your machine like you're doing 600 a day? Um, if you're doing 600 a day, maybe we need two machines. So it's kind of a, there's a balance there. I think with anything, when it comes down to this, there's, there's a lot of preference to it, but like you said, at the end of the day, I do think that a wax dot that, that dries and hardens is going to be a harder dot, but there's a lot more variables that go into purchasing a piece of equipment than just which one's going to give me the best dot. First of all, are you going to actually care about how good that dot is? Are you going to be trying to win awards with the best print? Because if you are, you're not going to actually have any real production value, right? Th th those shops, you know better than all of us, right? It may take you a day to finally get that one holy grail of a shirt that you're going to submit to that contest, right? If, if that's what you're going to do, then maybe you do want to, to be a snob about your, your dot and you want to go with, with a wax but there's more to it still, right? The user interface of the software and the rip, which one do you prefer? Who are you near when it comes to being able to have it serviced? That's a big one, right? When people come to me and say, okay, who's the better press? Who's the better this? Who's the best thing? Who's that? Who are you near? Who's going to support you? That's going to always be my default answer. My opinion doesn't fully matter. If you're within the top scale of the best of the DTSs that are out there, who, who do you like? Who supports you? That's the right answer. I, I'm not so much like, like you, I, I don't care so much about the wax versus the, the ink uh, quandary that's out there in the argument. I care about getting things done, right? So it goes back to the, do you want to spend a lot for perfect or do you want to get what you actually need as a shop to go through? I'm personally going to always be a fan of somebody getting two of the cheaper units to have the redundancy over ever selling them one of those larger units that may be able to push through uh, a higher amount, a higher dot, or have exposure built in, or any of those things, right? But I'm more of looking at the shops where they are as opposed to where they think they want to be. Most shops are, are they'll kind of go, okay, I can afford something. Let's get the best there is. Well, if you're driving two blocks, you're not going to buy a Porsche, right? Meeting your expectations where they actually need to be met. Make sure you have the equipment that's going to be serviceable and work near you, and one that you enjoy interfacing with. I think that oftentimes it's, it's easy to get kind of caught up in this this higher level of this dot madness, when most of the time it doesn't actually matter. You're holding a good enough dot 
on either one. But I would also agree with you that I'm going to always tell you run unidirectional unless you're doing like a, this shirt, fine, bidirectional is fine. If you're trying to hold any half dot, half tone, it's going to be unidirectional. So don't buy into the salesperson telling you about how fast it's going to go. Uh, with anything, who cares about the exposure with eight seconds? Are you going to be moving screens every eight seconds? No, right? So aim for reasonable and realistic, but don't get caught up so much in, in those little things. But I do have a question for you that I'm not sure about because I've got no experience with it. The future with lasers, is it, have you seen these? I want to know more about those. So that seems like a promising prospect, but it's so new, right? Like the, the original ice cream, ice cream, God awful. It took how long to get good. So I'm assuming lasers are probably in the same, same spot, right? I think it's really cool. First time I saw it and I saw the resolution under a loop, amazing dots. And this is what they're wrestling with right now. And I know they've got Zytron working with them. I'm trying to figure it out. Understanding the curve in reverse because we're, they're printing the negative space. So measuring gain is probably impossible just in concept because mm. you're taking away, you're not adding. So our typical linearization is done using the output positive onto the screen and then trying to correct the curve to come within what our tolerances are that we're trying to build for our, for our linearization. Mm. Now the only thing like the manufacturer will do is linearize or give you the settings to linearize to the output onto the screen. But what I thought was cool about the laser piece of it is they're not going to be able to do that. So they're going to have to go to press and print it and measure the actual mm. print and try to linearize, which my suggestion when we were talking is, what if you gave them a custom linearization? Because there's no way your print's gonna be exactly like mine. Squeegee, mesh, da, 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 there's a million variables. Stencil, there. yeah, all that. Times. But what if they had a few dummy settings that if you fall within these things, or they, you know, they send you a, a test kit, you output, you print, you send them back, and they linearize to your actual your actual printing. So there could be a real upside sell to that, that we would linearize to you. We're not just going to give you a bullshit set of settings that says the, the output is linearized. So it could be really cool because if they can figure out how to measure that piece of it, which they can, it's just, do they want to deal with that? Or do they want to try to take an average somewhere, do it in their lab, kind of take it from an output, bring it back, or a, a print itself, bring it back to the screen and adjust accordingly until they get that piece of it, at least in the can, to be able to sell. Now, I know they made some mistakes with glass in the first place. That was kind of a big duh moment for them when they, <laughs> oh, yeah, we should take the glass off of this. And now the unit that's commercially available in the U.S. is only a two-up unit. And price-wise, they can figure out how to get it to a single unit and get it in the thirty, forty thousand dollar range because I think it's at ninety now with the double up. And they had a couple going into beta, and I'm sure this whole thing has slowed a lot of that down and where they're at in their development. But it's cool. I, I would say that would be the next cool thing if they can figure out conceptually even how to measure the gain and the loss. I just like thinking about the people busy arguing about wax versus ink, and all of a sudden they just get like <laughs> lasers. <laughs> <It's> like, <"Ah." laughs> no, it's really cool. I, I, I like the idea where they're at with it. I haven't talked to the Saudi people in quite a while. Cool. Yeah, thanks. I was curious what your, your take on that. I've seen uh, somebody I admire a lot as, as well as you, right? Richard Greaves, working a lot with that. So I'm always trying to like uh, see if I can find out a little more information because it's, it's cutting edge. It's new. And I did. I, I like seeing where that's going to go. Be, I mean, because lasers are freaking cool, right? <laughs> if, we can, if we can get yeah. lasers to actually be a part of our process, like, give me in there. That's awesome. Yeah, so, yeah, that's curious right, yeah. to that. Yeah. It's also so far from what I understand. And I have not, I haven't played around with them. I've only talked to people that own, own some of the larger format ones, is speed. They're faster than like the DLP, but they're still working on speed. And I think that comes down to, if, my, if I understood it right, conversations with Saudi was, we can make them faster, but it's gonna increase the price because it becomes quality of the laser. So 
we add lasers or add quality of lasers, we can we can create more speed, and that's why they're going with the double up instead of the sink. So there's, you know, it, just like I said early on, there you get something, you got to give something up. So oh, um, yeah, it won't it be cool to get to a trade show and see where they're at with all that. Right soon, hopefully. Yeah, trade shows. That's an interesting concept. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you guys feel like is next for CTS? I'm probably nervous about it. Our CTS is paid for, and I'm nervous that the technology is going to change rapidly enough because it's digital. I don't think our manufacturers would play this game because we're too small of an industry. Um, but pull the Epson game, and all of a sudden they won't support it, and you can't get parts, and you can't buy the ink. You got to buy the new one. I hope we don't end up down that path, but when you're talking digital, I'm sure that everything's different. m and has got something different. I don't know where they're at with it now and whether they'll roll it out or not, but to replace what they're doing. I mean, even the, like you started out with, Matt, the evolution of their CTS, the, you know, the eye screen to the rocket ship to the eye image ST, and Matt knows this. I'll share this with the world. Anybody know what ST stands for? Second try. <laughs> so even m and knew that their first try wasn't a real good uh, solution. But I worked with a customer just a few years ago that was running three of them down in El Salvador. Still running ice creams. They love them. So they probably own every ice cream in the country or that they manufacture. Yeah, all the ones that are left. But you wonder, will they? God speed to them. <laughs> when will we not be able to get new print heads or things like that? That's kind of what it is. I don't know if I worry about that as much. I mean, I could see that happening. And, and that's another one of those peripherals that we talked about earlier when it goes to thinking about like the, the going to like jet film versus the uh, direct to screen is Epson, right? How many people all in one foul swoop, like 1430s, no longer get any support or any, any parts or, or get one, right? I think that we're going to see the singularity of, of everything that kind of happens, right? Like you, you build upon uh, new technologies and new technologies emerge. I do think lasers are probably a ways out just because there's too many parts to that. But I think we're already starting to see a lot more bootstrapped companies that aren't just the big heavy hitters making good options when it comes to CTS game, right? Uh, not only wax, but, but laser jet or uh, ink as well. I think we're gonna see more people come out, more players from across the world introduce themselves into the new world. And we're gonna see that price point continue to drop, right? Um, I mean, the, the I image ST you're talking about that came out with it with like a 70, $74,000 price point, I believe at first. And then all of a sudden, like four years later, there comes the S and that's at, at, at 32,000. I think mean, it's a 34 now, but those price points keep coming down because of singularity, right? You, you, you improve upon something and then you can mass produce it, make it cheaper, get more feedback, new equipment becomes available, new resources become available that keeps going down. So I'm actually really excited about seeing what else comes out and how much more affordable it might be to help more shops become uh, able to compete. That's one of the most fun things I like about this industry is I'm, I'm seeing the ability to not just have to be the big eight auto six manual shop that can afford this stuff. You can actually now be the three, four manual shop starting to afford this stuff and compete. So I'm looking forward to see who, what other players come to the table and what they bring to the table when it comes to new emerging technologies to, to make this more attainable for everybody. That's awesome. Another, another thing, uh, thinking about the future or, or what's coming down and, and uh, it doesn't apply to everybody out there, but the uh, uh, matching up CTS with hybrid printing, um, just making your screens with, with the uh, uh, digital onboard uh, inkjet on an automatic press. I mean, that's happening and it's happening fairly fast around the world and, and, and starting to really take off here too. So you have to be able to digitally build your screen to match your output. Um, they gotta be able to talk to each other. So at, at one point, I'm sure you could write that or figure out how to make film to match up, but matching film to each other is hard enough. Um, so the, the CTS is probably the only way that you're able to do uh, digital hybrid uh, uh, type screen printing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't thought about that. I think that we're going to see that emerge even more, including on manual presses here in the very soon future. So I, yeah, I, I didn't thought about that aspect. That's a big, big part of it. With most of these factories or manufacturers uh, 
not spending a whole lot of time in people's shops. I have a feeling we're, we're getting some developmental things that, that we could see um, that were sort of just high in the sky maybe a year ago that are gonna get fast tracked, like a, like a less expensive digital squeegee, like a 20 something thousand CTS, or you know, just trying to find expanding markets uh, where they, they can put more products in more printers' hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Less time at the trade shows, more time in R and D. Trade show folks, silver, we'll silver lining. Hey, we're here. really excited. We're, <laughs> we are very excited to be back at the shows. But no, it is it is interesting allowing you know companies to help focus on different things to be able to to stay afloat and everything. That's been awesome. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate a lot of being able to join us today and and share some of your insight, especially as you even talked about having struggling, you know, making that shift over. So this has been hugely helpful. That's Lon Winters. You can find him at graphicelephants.com. Lon does a ton of consulting work for small, medium, large shops all over the place. You can be able to reach out to Lon. So much experience to be able to share. And we'll actually drop a link down below for his Print Hustles Conf talk, which was really, really great as well. So So you couldn't have cut out the part where I was struggling with getting the (laughs) screen up? No, it was... was, You know, it's it's hard with the split screen. It it really is, especially and then you're also sharing it and it was live. Like nah, it's it the was only awesome. Time I've ever seen Lon Struggle. I've seen him for years in shops. <laughs> He's the best at what he does. That was the only time I've ever seen him. We like, swear. He is, he is human. Look at that. All right. <laughs> yeah. Actually I had a couple of deaf guys say that no, it was awesome because I could actually hear you and read along and so I knew what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah, done. Thanks again, Lon. You bet. It's my pleasure. Thank you, guys.